Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Well, hey there, everybody who loves paleontology and dinosaurs. This is Dinosaur George, and you are listening to podcast number 110. In this episode, our feature creature is Morus Raptor, or if you want to pronounce it like uh, we do here in the United States, Morus Raptor. But its true pronunciation is Morus Raptor. How do I know such a thing? because I had the opportunity to interview the man who found it, Dr. Rodolfo Coria, and he's going to be, his interview is going to come up in just a few moments. It is a very exciting interview, and I guarantee you, you're going to enjoy it. He's an incredibly kind man, very smart, and had some really interesting things to say, not only about that dinosaur, but about a lot of the other things being found there in Argentina and South America. And then at the end, we'll do a few Ask Dinosaur George questions. But the majority of this podcast is going to be dedicated to that interview and the subject matter. So let's get into it. Enjoy yourself. And uh, here we go. Raptors are the most deadly dinosaurs that ever lived. And now you can own their replica claws, feet, and skulls. Imagine your own Velociraptor skull or the foot of a giant Utah Raptor. Raptor hand claws and deadly killer claws are just some of the items you'll find in our web store. We accept all forms of payment and ship worldwide. Our pricing is affordable and we don't charge outrageous shipping or handling fees. Visit our website at store.dinosaurgeorge.com and start your collection today. It's time for our feature creature segment. If you would like to suggest a creature, go to dinosaurgeorgepodcast.com and post it in the comments section of this episode or email us your suggestions to contact at dinosaurgeorge.com. And now, our feature creature. The feature creature of this episode is Mortis Raptor barosiensis. This is an eight meter long, which is about 26 feet long, predatory dinosaur. It's bipedal, which means it walks on two legs. It was discovered in Sierra Barossa, which is in northwest Patagonia, in, uh, in a canyon wall back in 2001. Its name means wall raptor because of where it was found. It was found in a canyon wall. So its name, Mutus raptor, means wall raptor. And the word raptor means thief or stealer or robber. Um, the last name, all dinosaurs have a first and last name. The last name comes from Barossa, where it was found. Now, this thing has relatively short teeth. It doesn't have those long, sharp teeth that we sometimes think all carnivores have. It had relatively short teeth. They, they appear, to, appear to be very sharp, but uh, it did have really powerful hand claws. So this is a dinosaur that absolutely is using its hands to, to terrorize anything that it came in contact with. Now, although it has the word raptor in its name, it's not part of the family that most people think of when you say raptor. Let me explain to make sure this makes sense. The word raptor to paleontologists is a generic word that applies to any carnivorous dinosaur. Two-legged carnivorous dinosaurs are referred to as raptors by many people in paleontology. But in the public, when we use the word raptor, we're usually describing a dinosaur that paleontologists call dromaeosaurs. Now, dromaeosaurs, one of their distinguishing features is a curved claw on the inside toe of each foot. And that curved claw is a sickle-shaped claw, and that was used, assuming it was used as a weapon. Well, when you see the word raptor in the name of a dinosaur, don't immediately come to the conclusion that it had that curved claw. Because Mortis Raptor does not have that curved claw. It was given the word Raptor in its name because of that, uh, because of that curved claw. Now, to tell us more about Mortis Raptor and some of the other amazing discoveries in Argentina is world-renowned paleontologist, Dr. Rodolfo Correa. Dr. Correa, it is an honor to have you on our show. Welcome. 
Uh, thank you very much for you, and it's my pleasure to be here. Great. Now, you're, uh, let me ask you, have, has Argentina always been home for you? Is that, is that where you've lived most of your life? Yeah. Yeah, yes. You are, you're very fortunate because of the discoveries coming out of your country. Were you interested in dinosaurs as a child, or was that later on in your life that you became interested well, uh, I was always interested in dinosaurs for the movies and, and books, and uh, but actually the uh, the way that I became a paleontologist, a professional paleontologist, was just a coincidence. And uh, I, 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 as a as a uh, undergrad student, I wrote a letter to the National Museum, offering myself as a volunteer, and uh, I didn't have any expectation to where to work in in that museum, but my letter went straight to the uh, paleontology division. And, uh, and there, there was a, uh, a very important, famous Argentinian paleontologist at that time called uh, Jose Bonaparte. And he was working on dinosaurs, and he accepted myself as a volunteer in his division. And I, that's what I, I, I became, began, began working with dinosaurs. That's amazing. I am very familiar, and I assure you, a lot of my listeners are very familiar with Dr. Bonaparte's work as well. What a what a great teacher to have, and especially as your first teacher, uh, what a, what a great opportunity that must have been for you. Absolutely, absolutely. I was I was very fortunate. I'm very lucky. Uh, uh, Dr. Bonaparte is probably the most most important Argentinian paleontologist in the history, or at least in the 20th century. And uh, so I was very fortunate to, to work with him and to, to, to have him as my mentor. So now do you have young people working for you that, that you're kind of bringing along? Yeah, yes, I'm doing the same. But for children, but of course, my students are not as lucky as I was as a student. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not born a party. Uh, <laughs> well, I think you're. I think you're selling yourself short. I think that based on everything I've read about you, and based on what people think of you that have met you, I think you are just as important to Argentinian paleontology. Uh, as Dr. Bonaparte, and he is certainly an an, an amazing well, thank man. Thank you for the, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Tell that to my students. Then. <laughs> <laughs> they, they would probably disagree because for me, <laughs> you can't give me a grade for my work, so I could say anything, and I don't have to worry. <laughs> <laughs> so so many discoveries in your country. So many amazing discoveries especially dinosaurs uh, tell, yeah. tell us some of the some of the more fascinating i mean obviously there's so many but tell us about some of the more fascinating discoveries well the, the dinosaurs in argentina are known since the uh, the end of 19th century and uh, um, there are i don't know maybe a hundred different species of dinosaurs already known from this country uh, including the oldest dinosaurs ever discovered as Herrerosaurus and Eoraptor, or uh, some of the biggest uh, dinosaurs in the world, like Argentinosaurus, uh, it's, a, it's a very big plant-eating dinosaur, or Giganotosaurus, that's a very big meat-eating dinosaur. Um, uh, there's so many different kind of dinosaurs that uh, that that's why there there are so many dinosaur paleontologists working in this country and uh, it's it's uh, most of our projects are done in Patagonia with an extensive arid uh, badland uh, with uh, rocks of different age ages and uh, that's why we are collecting dinosaurs from so many different environments and also different different ages. Uh, and, and yes, yes, it's, it's amazing how many different dinosaurs have been discovered in this country. And, uh, and uh, we are dinosaurs just like uh, Carnotaurus, it's a, it's a meat-eating with horns. And, uh, or Morus raptor, for example, that is, is a very, uh, very new and very unique uh, uh, dinosaur. I am so amazed that you have... Triassic dinosaurs and, yes. and late Cretaceous from from a distance by kilometer. How f 
far apart are the formations between, is it a long distance, like from one end of the country to the other, where you're finding Triassic and then Cretaceous, or is it relatively close? Well, it depends. It depends. And uh, the, uh, the uh, Triassic rocks uh, uh, with uh, 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 where Herrerasaurus was found, for example, is, are in the northern part of Argentina. And I'm working in Patagonia, which is the southern part of Argentina. And uh, so if, uh, if uh, uh, they're something like 2,000 kilometers apart, but uh, even in the Triassic area of Herrerasaurus, in the surrounding areas, there are also Jurassic and Cretaceous outcrops, as well as in Patagonia, we can find Triassic rocks and Jurassic rocks in the near area. So... Sometimes we don't need to move so far away in order to to visit it. different ages of rocks. Uh, but sometimes we have. It depends. And Argentina is a very extensive area, uh, country, just like the U.S. So sometimes uh, the distance are, are important. That's amazing. You know, with, with Argentinosaurus and Giganotosaurus, yeah. here you have two enormous dinosaurs is it it was there something about prehistoric argentina that allowed these animals to grow to such giant proportions was there is there something different about that country that would not have been the same in in others well i i don't i don't think so because uh, big dinosaurs, big sizes in dinosaurs are recorded in many, many different parts of the world. Uh, so um, even if we, in Argentina, we have found Argentinosaurus, in U.S. you have Supersaurus, for example, and, uh, and, and other giant uh, uh, forms uh, about the same size of, uh, of Argentinosaurus. And uh, um, there are also giant sauropods known uh, from Mongolia and from Africa. Um, it's the same with the, with the meat-eating dinosaurs. Meat, big meat-eating are known in, in, in North America with Tyrannosaurus rex, for example, or, or Gorgosaurus. And, and in the southern uh, masses, we have uh, Carcarodontosaurus in Africa and Giganotosaurus in South America. So... I think that the big size in dinosaurs is uh, is uh, it's uh, occurred uh, at in different times and also in different areas of the world. Uh, Argentina is not the only place where you can find giant dinosaurs. Right. You know, I, I guess what it is is the the media, the newspapers, and television stations only seem to want to report on the biggest. And so I guess because (laughs) (laughs) the only time we hear about a new discovery is when it, and they always use the word bigger than like everything has to be the next size up. And then of course, after it's measured, it's reduced in size. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, sometimes it's important. Sometimes it's not, it's not as important. And, uh, but um, yet uh, finding a individual, very big individual, doesn't mean much. Uh, at least you have a context in terms of uh, the uh, uh, relationships with that individual in terms of family or, and, or in terms of what kind of group of dinosaurs you are dealing with. Um, but yes, yeah, sometimes the, uh, the size is, a, is, a, is more a plain thing that, uh, than... Uh, other uh, paleontological characteristics, and uh, but um, um, the uh, the effect of uh, of finding Argentinosaurus or Giganotosaurus in in this country is not really uh, an exclusive thing of the area. Uh, there are giant forms known everywhere. Right. Our Argentinosaurus arguably is the largest dinosaur, and obviously there's so many factors into that, but. Do you believe that that any dinosaurs could have really exceeded the size of something the size of Argentinosaurus? Because at some point it would seem like they would become almost too big to just be able to do the normal things that they do. Do you see any dinosaurs being bigger than those? It's a good question, and uh, first, first, 
Argentina Soros, I mean, I never, I never said that Argentina Soros is the biggest dinosaur sure, ever. Sure. And, uh, uh, this, it's, it's something that came from other, other voices, other, other people, not from the paleontologists. Um, but yes, Argentina Soros is among the biggest uh, terrestrial animals ever walked in Earth because we have the bones and we can measure measure those bones and we compare those bones with other uh, big animals. Um, and it's true that Argentinosaurus and Puertasaurus and Frutaloncosaurus and Supersaurus and Brachiosaurus are, are very big animals. Um, I think it's, it's hard to imagine animals, an animal even bigger, substantially bigger than this one. It's hard to imagine. Uh, I think that we are uh, reaching the peak of size uh, developed by a terrestrial form uh, in these in these in these animals, in these dinosaurs, in these in this club of giant dinosaurs. But I mean, I'm willing to find something bigger. I mean, the, the, the nature always surprises you. Uh, surprise you, and uh, so uh, um, I don't know if if we can find in the future something double the size of Argentina Soros. And uh, but it could be a little bigger. It could be uh, there are you know chances to find a dinosaur with vertebrates uh, slightly bigger than the one that we like, collected from Argentina Soros. Yes, why not? But I don't think it's going to be substantially bigger. I think that it's hard to imagine uh, animals uh, with a size uh, uh, dramatically bigger than this one. Right. I, I, I have to ask you, Dr. Coria, when, when you are standing there in front of these outcrops and you know that somewhere buried maybe a centimeter beneath the dirt could be the a remarkable find are you does it make you frustrated that you cannot see those pieces or <laughs> is it exciting that one day you might well no i i i my brain works differently and uh, uh when when i i i i i am uh, uh, when i am out in the field um I don't think how many things I am not seeing. I better think how many things can I see. And, uh, and I just pay attention of the ground and I look carefully in the uh, ground. I'm trying to read the uh, uh, morphology of the rocks in order to understand or to in order to to pick up the right spot, spot where to find bones, I'm trying to see if I can see bones. I don't think how many things are still buried out there. Um, I'm just go out there and, and, and try to find more. You're a better man than I, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I believe I would just stand there and scream that I cannot see what's there. So no, 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 I, no, no. I, it doesn't mean I am better. I mean, I'm just, you know, probably I'm more patient than you. <laughs> well, if you if you ever receive a letter from me that says I want to follow in your footsteps, don't read the letter. Send it back. I would not be very good help in the field. I'm afraid. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure that, that uh, you can be very good at it. <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about this amazing Mortis Raptor. This, I was so excited because, uh, of course, I love I love the big predators, and I think a lot of people do. But but honestly, I find some of the mid sized predators to be even more interesting because I look at them and think of them as not just big lumbering animals but now we're kind of getting into to a little more speed and a little more active uh, yeah. so so describe modus raptor for us and tell us sort of what this thing is yeah 
Well, that, you're absolutely right in this thing. And uh, Modus Raptor represents, it's part of a group of the, uh, um, of, of that kind of dinosaur that we had in nightmares 20 years ago. Um, the, uh, you, you see, you are, I'm pretty sure that you and your audience know, remember the uh, raptors in the uh, Jurassic Park movie. Oh, yes. Uh, the raptors in that movie actually don't exist in the fossil record. They are inspired in Deinonychus. And, uh, but Deinonychus is probably half or more smaller the size of the raptors in the movie. Uh, so the size of Deinonychus or Velociraptor was increased in that movie just because uh, a, a dramatic means. I mean, uh, the, uh, the movie needed uh, a, a, a raptor, a, a ferocious and nasty and mean dinosaur uh, about that size um, which didn't exist at that time for the uh, human knowledge. Uh, Murus Raptor and other mega raptors, they have that size. They are the raptors in the, in the nightmare of paleontologists of Jurassic Park. Uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, ecological role of of mega raptorids in the ecosystems was actually that role depicted by uh, the raptors in in Jurassic Park movie. Uh, these many fast and uh, ferocious and nasty predators. Uh, powerful, uh, fast, and with huge clocks in the in the uh, hands, and enormous mouths with uh, sharp teeth, and uh, and and it's so exciting to find these uh, animals. It was so exciting to find these animals in Patagonia, and even especially Modus Raptor, which is one of the most complete so far. Um, so. This is the, uh, the excitement of, of Morus Raptor because it's representing that kind of dinosaur that was, you know, uh, foreseen in Jurassic Park and we have now for real. Man, what a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> but I, lo- I love them. Well, so Morus Raptor comes from the same family as Mega Raptor, but a lot of, yes. a lot of children hear the word Raptor and so in their mind, they then associate it with the dinosaurs that have the killing claw on the foot. But that is not the case, right? The word raptor to a paleontologist doesn't mean Deinonychus or Velociraptor. The, the word raptor is used at how? Yeah, the thing is that uh, this is a consequence that sometimes paleontologists are not always right. Uh, the uh, when Mega Raptor was first found, the paleontologist that worked at that fossil found these giant claws, and he thought it was a claw for the foot from the foot of the animal. Um, but it was so big, um, he, he he saw that that claw was quite similar to the Nanicus of Velociraptor foot claw. But it was so big that it was representing a way bigger animal than the Nanicus or Velociraptor. That's why he named it Megaraptor, because at that time he thought that this animal from Patagonia was related with the Nanicus and other raptors. Later on, with another skeleton of Megaraptor was found, they realized that those giant claws that they have was from the hands, not from the foot. Ah. But the name remained it. You cannot change the name once you publish the new species. Right. So even Megaraptor was thought 
first to be related with raptors. Now we know that they are not, but the name remains. And, uh, and that's why sometimes it could produce some confusion with, uh, with, the, uh, with the name of this uh, uh, group of megaraptorids. Right. Still, still, the name raptor not necessarily means something connected with the Inonicus or Velociraptor. The name raptor is related with a, a, a possible behavior thought for these animals in terms of preda- predation. It means predator. Right. And mega raptors were very active predators. So the name match matches still. Right. So even though with mega raptor, the paleontologist originally thought it would have belonged to that group with Deinonychus and Velociraptor. Yeah. The big claw was from the hand, not the foot. But because the word raptor is used to describe a predatory dinosaur, there would be no need to change the name. And that's why Mutus raptor has the word raptor in it. Has nothing to do with Deinonychus. No. No, no. They are they are far distantly related. Right. Now, let me ask you about looking at Mutus raptor and looking at the size. Do you mm. think that dinosaur would have been a specialized hunter that's designed for really catching something individual or would they have worked together perhaps to bring down larger prey than themselves? Oh, we don't have the evidence to say that. And uh, we know we collected only one skeleton of one single individual. Um, For imagine uh, uh, a grouping or group behavior or, or some sort of collective behavior in hunting, you need another evidence. Uh, for example, finding several skeletons buried together uh, in a single quarry or some sort of uh, uh, evidence uh, from the skeletons of the prey eventually. And, uh, but we don't, we don't have any of these uh, kind of proofs to imagine that. It, it's possible uh Mutus raptor could be a species of predators that get together in order to uh, produce some sort of a collaboration for hunting big prey. Uh, it could be possible, but we don't have any evidence to say that. Right. But that would the, be fantastic. It's a fantastic scenario. It's a fantastic oh, picture, you know? Oh. A, a, a pack of Mutus raptor attacking uh, 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 some sort of a giant sauropod or something related with Argentina. That would be a fantastic show to watch. Oh, could you imagine? From the distance, of course. Yeah, From the distance, of course. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> now, even though you only have the one specimen, and of course it is not possible to, to, to know with any certainty whether they hunted alone or together, but by the huh. evidence that you see in this animal, there's no doubt that it is a, a, a certainly one of the top predators of its area, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we have a, a good sampling of the teeth of, of, of Morus raptor. Uh, these teeth were small and very sharp uh, with uh, 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 serrated edges, and they were very well adapted for slicing meat. Uh, the uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, column vertebrate and the uh, limb bones we have indicate the insertion of a very strong and powerful um, muscles. Uh, uh, so I'm pretty sure that it was a very highly active active predator and the top predator of the ecosystem at that time. Now the teeth are relatively small, yes. yet the claws are very large. So does that suggest a, a habit? Does that suggest to you that they're using perhaps their arms to do more killing? Or are the arms 
perhaps used to hold the prey while the teeth... It could be, it could be both. It could be both. Uh, uh, holding the prey and, and uh, producing some sort of uh, uh, damages important in certain sensitive areas of the body of the prey by, uh, or to, to just use the, the, uh, the uh, sharp of the claw to, you know, to hurt the prey, uh, the prey uh, badly. And uh, the uh, claws of Megaraptoris are very sharp, are very big and very sharp. So probably they were you know, very good, uh, 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 very efficient weapons, but also uh, very um, uh, um, good for holding uh, down the prey because the, the hands were very, bad, uh, very big and, and very active, very mobile. And uh, so uh, I think that they could be of, I mean, they could be useful for both ways. Boy, what a what a machine that must have been to have. Oh those yeah, abso- no- ab- oh. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think it was a, a perfection of uh, of of the uh, of the uh, of, uh, of a predator role in the uh, mid Cretaceous in Paragonia, at least. Wow, you know, a lot of the young children that get the opportunity to see dinosaur skeletons, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, they say, when I look at the claws of the skeleton. They don't look that sharp to me, but what they're uh-huh. seeing is not what it would look like when the animal was alive, right? No, right, because uh, what when they are looking at the skeleton, you are you are uh, they are looking the bone that it was inside the claws of the animals. Uh, these uh, the claws were actually even bigger than they look in the skeleton because they were. Uh, um, um, like uh, with it was uh, there was a, 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 a how you say it was, they were uh, insheded by uh, a, a, an structure like keratin uh, like keratin like exactly a like oh. hoofs or or like uh, like the horns on in other animals which are uh, they have a bone inside and then the real horn uh, the uh, the real claw was bigger and sharper like just like in, in birds for example. That they the uh, the claws of the birds they have inside a tiny bone claw. Right. So the claw of the skeleton is the bone inside. But if you mm. added that sheath, that that keratin claw that went over it, that is what. But you can tell by the shape of the bone what the shape of the claw would be. So when you say it had sharp claws, that's based on you look at the core. And you say because of its shape, when we apply the keratin covering, it would have made this a very deadly weapon. Exactly, because the uh, the uh, keratin cloth uh, proxy the uh, the shape of the of the of the bone claw. Right. So I read where the specimen does not appear to be a fully grown adult. Is that true? And if so, how are you able to to theorize that? Yeah, technically th- that's true, and uh, the um, the specimen of Morus raptor was not showing the uh, the um, top size of the species. That uh, apparently the the specimen could grow up a little more if uh, and uh, in, and the adult the full adult specimens could be a little bigger, uh, but no substantially much bigger than the specimen uh, that it actually is. And uh, um, we know this because uh, certain parts of the uh, backbones uh, are not completely fused together. Uh, The uh, complete fusion of the backbones occurred in the adult age of the specimen, just like us. And, uh, And so... Uh, when you find this kind of uh, separation or infusion situation of the backbones, uh, you can say that it's, in, it's an immature individual. Uh, but uh, considering that uh, the size of the uh, of the uh, of the bones um, these, um, and other elements, just like a, a certain uh, uh, 
futures in the skull, we can say that uh, even this animal was uh, not a fully adult. He was near the top size of, of the species. So will there be any way for you to estimate the actual age of the animal? Is that possible to do that? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, it, it was a, a grown-up uh, individual, and uh, but uh, not, uh, not a senior citizen of the ecosystem, right. if you know what I mean. Yeah. They, get, they get eaten, right? <laughs> He was he was in the maturity of the uh, of the of his life, but he was still young, just like uh, in the twenties, probably in the uh, in the uh, uh, like a, a twenty year twenty years old man. Right. And um, um, but we can we can say that, but making but by making thin sections and looking thin section of the bones under microscope. Right. Now, I also read that your specimen had what appears to be tooth marks from another theropod. Did it, and is that a, a normal thing that you've seen in other predatory dinosaurs? Well, I don't think there are two marks. I think that there are pathological uh, uh, processes in the bones, uh, um, uh, probably as results of of encounters with other predators uh, um, by fights. They have broken bones, many ribs, broken ribs in the skeleton, uh, probably by uh, products as a, a very bad fall or a, a, a fight with another, another dinosaur or another, another individual, another, you know, another guy. Sure. And, uh, but we don't have tooth marks, uh, but we do have a lot of broken bones. Wow. So you're able to tell you're able to tell when a bone has been broken like when 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 a person who doesn't get a chance to study like you when we hear that there are broken bones we're thinking that the bone is the fossil is broken and the question is well can't they how did they know it was broken Oh no! The uh, the bone was broken in life of the individuals, and then some of these fractures heal. Ah! And so we can see the uh, calyx, the healing calyx of a broken bone. Um, but also, we have found certain pathological areas in the head of Motoraptor, uh, part of a uh, of the skull is completely pathological and they have some sort of an, an infection in the bones of the skull and probably that process has produced the death of the animal. Wow. So it was very painful. Uh, the last days of these animals were very, very painful for, for sure. Wow. I can imagine that a dinosaur like that, who is not like the, like the giant dinosaur, like the big predators, the Tyrannosaurus and the Giganotosaurus, that just their size would probably be enough to somewhat limit the confrontations that they dealt with. But when you're dealing with a medium sized predator who's having to fight other predators and then fight animals, maybe its own size to kill. It, I guess it's not surprising that we would see injuries throughout its lifetime, right? Oh yeah, it's not surprises a lot. I think that the lives of this, the lives of these guys were very tough. Wow, I still would give anything to see that though. Just, yeah. just amazing. So, um, the brain case from your specimen was fairly well preserved. Is, is that correct? Yes, yes. It's the it's the very well preserved, except that the pathological area, and uh, and it's the most complete brain case known from this family of, of meat-eating dinosaurs. So what can be done? We, we hear so much about CT scanning. Is that something yeah. you'll consider doing? Yes, we did. We did. We did CT scan of, of, the, uh, of the brain case, and uh, it's showing an a interesting, you know, faceable brain for most raptor. And uh, it's uh, it, the, uh, the uh, 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 taking... Uh, under consideration 
the size of the animal, the size of the of the uh, brain of bull rap or of bullus raptor was uh, proportionally bigger than in other in other meat eating dinosaurs. Oh. Interesting. So interesting. A, a bigger brain doesn't necessarily mean that it was smarter, but it would no, seem no. to suggest. No, no, no. But that's amazing that it would have a much larger brain than uh, dinosaurs its same size. So I wonder what the benefit would be. I mean, is it, that's, that's tough. Well, yeah, I think that apparently certain areas, especially the, uh, the uh, uh, vision area and areas and the uh, hearing areas of the brain were more developed than in other, in other predators. So probably uh, these, these groups have a certain uh, of neurological adaptations in order to be uh, more efficient predators than other species. That's um, so they're fast and they're armed and they're relatively smart. I don't think yes. you find anything more dangerous in the world than that, except for maybe humans. We're the only ones that are more advanced. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so are you working right now on, on anything that you can share with us? Is there anything interesting or new? I obviously, I, I realize you can't speak directly to some of the things but is there anything of interest that would be coming up later and the reason why i ask this it's a selfish question because i'm hoping that in the future we could have you back because i've just been fascinated by this conversation and i'm hoping there may be something on the horizon that uh, we could bring you back and discuss of course of course anytime anytime and uh, this is what we do for a living so we are finding dinosaurs all the time <laughs> oh well i I cannot wait to see what comes out of that, out of your country, because it seems like every time something is found, it is, it is amazing and it's fantastic. And the world is lucky to have someone like you out there bringing it and sharing it with, uh, with the world because for thank the, you very much. Uh, for there, those of us, there, there, I'm, I'm just one of many, many Argentinian paleontologists working in dinosaurs. So there, that's why there are so many dinosaurs coming out because there are many people working in the field. Well, we, and we're grateful that you are. Um, so I'd love to have you back again. And I, I hope you've enjoyed the interview. I certainly have. Very uh, much. I did very much. Good. He is one of the most recognized paleontologists in the world. He is Dr. Rodolfo Correa. Thank you so much for your time. And it truly has been an honor to speak with you. You are more what George. Good to, to talk with you. Thank you. Well, that was an interview with Dr. Coria, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. it he's one of the people that I could have spent two hours speaking to, and I, I can only imagine the things that he could share with us uh, about what they've discovered down there. So uh, I, I, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Coming up next, I'll answer a couple of questions from listeners on the Ask Dinosaur George segment. So hang around. We'll be right back. Did you know that our online store is not just about dinosaurs? We have a huge collection of modern replica skulls, including mammals, sea life, reptiles, birds, and more. And teachers, these skulls are great for the classroom. Show your students the skull of a dodo bird, great auk, or Tasmanian wolf. The majority of these skulls are cast from original specimens from the California Academy of Sciences. Go to store.dinosaurgeorge.com to see our complete line of museum-quality casts and replicas. It's time to ask Dinosaur George. In this segment, George answers your questions about paleontology. If you would like to leave a voice message, call us at 210-888-9077. This is not a toll-free call, so children, please ask your parents' permission. If you would like to submit your question in writing, go to dinosaurgeorge.com and click the Ask Dinosaur George page. Questions are chosen at random and we clear all messages monthly. So if you have a question about paleontology, ask Dinosaur George. Hello, George. My name is Eric from Hurricane, Utah, in the United States of America. And I'm a Utah native and amateur fossil hunter, and I have a question for you regarding areas and their geologic ages. I find fossils of brachiopods and small snail-like creatures at the base of the Hurricane Cliff Formation in Utah and Arizona, but the Internet doesn't help me understand what geologic age I'm looking at. And I was wondering if there was a good resource to go to for that. Thank you very much, and thank you for the work that you do. 
Well, hey there, Eric. It's very good to hear from you. And thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, I hope you enjoy the podcast and I certainly enjoy hearing questions from you guys. So I tell you, I, I did a little research as well, and I understand what you mean about uh, difficulty finding some of the information. But let me tell you what I found. I found that uh, I found a website called uh, Silver Reef Utah dot org. SilverReefUtah.org, spelled S-I-L-V-E-R-R-E-E-F-U-T-A-H.org. One word, SilverReefUtah.org. And then there's a page on there about the Hurricane Cliffs. Um, so uh, and if you want to, you can do backslash hurricane.cliffs.html, but you can find it if you go to SilverReefUtah.org. So according to their website, The base of the Hurricane Cliffs um, represents Lower Permian about 270 million years ago. The top of those cliffs, and it says that it's capped by a yellowish-brown limestone deposit, that dates back 250 million years, right at the beginning of the Triassic. So I'm guessing, based on the website that I was able to find, those brachiopods and things that you're finding are Permian age, which is pretty exciting uh, you know, I I love Cretaceous stuff, but I got to tell you, I absolutely love some of the earlier life. So that's my best guess, Eric. And I hope you can go to that website and maybe find a, a, somebody there that could give you a little more information about that, uh, about that. Um, certainly, there must be other websites out there that could give us some real detailed information about that particular um formation but that's the best i could find so thank you so so much for writing to me eric and please uh, are writing calling in and please feel free to do that anytime you want all right let's go to richard who lives in vancouver british columbia i have a dinosaur skull and i can't identify it richard a lot of times people will send me images you can go you can email them to contact at dinosaurgeorge.com and i'll do my best to try to identify them for you Um, the most important thing to do when you send pictures is to be specific where you found them, not the exact spot, you know, for fossil hunters, we don't want to give up our locations. And and I understand that. So all you need to do is give me the general area that you found it in. And at least that's a starting point. And if I can't identify them, I can tell you there's a, there's a number of different Facebook pages dedicated to helping people identify, identify fossils. So that may be a good resource. Also, Eric, if you're still listening, you know, that's something I didn't think about as well. You might want to uh, look on Facebook for some of the different fossil groups and see if you could post your question there and find out if somebody might be able to give you a better answer than I did. Okay. Uh, Michael, from Lago Vista, Texas, he says, hello, George. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer my previous question about Acrocanthosaurus and being feathered. It meant a lot to me, and it was very interesting to hear your opinion on that matter. In the meantime, I have another question about some local dinosaurs. About 20 minutes north of Lago Vista, which is in the Austin area, there's a bridge that crosses the South San Gabriel River. <laughs> Big word. South San Gabriel River. If you walk for a bit up the river, there are a bunch of dinosaur trackways preserved. Trackways that look like um, Acrocanthosaurus and and big sauropod. My question is, normally in an ecosystem, small and medium-sized herbivores are the most common. However, the only two commonly preserved tracks they find are the big ones I just mentioned, Acrocanthosaurus and a big sauropod. So his question is, why aren't there smaller dinosaur tracks in these areas? Uh, wants to know is it is it because they weren't heavy enough to leave a deep enough impression or could there be another reason thanks again for the kind words and response to my last question it meant a lot keep doing what you're doing michael michael thank you very much for your kind words i appreciate it okay yeah you know it has a lot to do with the weight of the animal Uh, well it has to do with three things the weight of the animal the condition of the um of the formation of those tracks And then finally, whether or not small animals dare go into mud for fear of getting stuck, they may not have the strength to walk through mud. So let's start with the weight. Tracks are formed two ways. One, they can walk through soft mud, leave their footprints, and then that mud bakes very, very hard in the sun. 
and is able to withstand the next time it floods and fills the center of the track with sediment, which kind of helps preserve the shape. That's one way. That way, a smaller dinosaur could walk through and very easily leave tracks because uh, that's that uh, that mud is exposed and it's soft and it's gooey and they can walk right through it. The other way is that there can be a thin clay layer beneath the soft, soupy mud on the top. And if you're really big and you step down, you go through that soft, soupy stuff and then you leave a very distinct footprint in that clay layer. Then that hardens and you get a much better track. Usually when you're in soft mud on the top, on the surface, that mud will collapse back into the hole after you walk through so it doesn't leave as nice a track. So if you're really big and really heavy, you can walk through the soft stuff. You leave a footprint beneath it. And when you lift up, the top part collapses back in and it just leaves odd shapes. So you're much better likely, you're much more likely to leave a better footprint if it's in clay rather than the soft, thick, gooey mud. Uh, So that's, that's one of the reasons. And finally, like I said, a lot of small animals are very cautious about walking out into mud because they don't have the body strength to be able to pull their legs out if the mud turns out to be really sticky. So maybe it was a combination of the environment wasn't right to leave the footprints of the lighter ones, or maybe they just didn't want to venture out into it. But whatever the case, you're right. Larger dinosaurs in most areas, at least in Texas, are more likely to leave their footprints. All right, finally, let's go to Vincent, who lives in or- Orondo, Washington. He said, did dinosaurs live up to the Ice Age? No, Vincent, they didn't. The Ice Age is separated by a dramatic amount of time between when the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. Now, again, dinosaurs, birds are considered dinosaurs. So I guess my answer should have been, yes, the avian dinosaurs lived up to the Ice Age and to through today. But I, I know your question when you're talking about dinosaurs, you're referring to those animals that look like what we think a dinosaur should look like. So I understand that's what you meant, Vincent. So so technically, yes, the dinosaurs survived all the way up to the Ice Age through today. But those that are not birds did not survive. They died out long before the Ice Age. So the Ice Age would have seen, of course, animals like the giant bears and the giant bison and the mammoth and the saber tooth and the giant sloth. Those animals survived, but the dinosaurs died out way, way before that occurred. The Ice Age, I think, what is 10,000 or maybe that's when it ended a million years ago and the dinosaurs died out about 65 million. So whatever the case, it, it was a very long stretch of time. All right, everybody, that wraps up this podcast. I hope you all enjoyed it. I want to say again how much I appreciate Dr. Rodolfo Correa for taking time out of his schedule to allow me to interview him. That was a lot of fun. Make sure to follow me on Facebook and Twitter. You can find uh, on Facebook, you can find links to both Facebook and Twitter on my podcast page which is dinosaurgeorgepodcast.com. And uh, also make sure to, to check out my catalog if you have somebody in your family that's interested in fossil replicas. Uh, that is at store.dinosaurgeorge.com. And finally, please feel free to go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com, and there's links to everything there. Until next time, make sure to treat everybody around you with kindness and respect. It makes the world a so much better place to live in. Take care, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event, please visit our website at dinosaurgeorge.com. Until next time, keep digging for clues about the past. 